Balakun, a bridge to Ukraine. Join the conversation at balakun.co. Balakun, міст в Україну. Долучайтесь до наших розмов на 3w.balakun.co. Hi, welcome, and we are so happy to have our first guest on the podcast. Vita, are you excited for our first guest? I'm very excited. Very excited. We have Daniel Broomfield, who is the director of Redwood Online English School, and he has been living in Ukraine for 10 years, he just told me. Would you like to introduce yourself, Daniel? Yes, yeah, so good morning. First of all, thank you for thank you for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so yeah, so as you've said, um, I'm the director of uh, Redwood uh, Online School of English, but I've been living and working for uh, 10 years in Ukraine, um, ten ye- uh, four years in Odessa, four years in Kyiv, um, and then now when I live in Ukraine, when I'm in Ukraine, I should say, um, I live in Lutsk uh, in, in the northwest of the country, and I've been there for two years now. Um, but yeah, my, my entire life has been around teaching English and most of it's been spent, most of my adult life has been spent in Ukraine as it is. Yeah. So have you, have you always been a teacher or did you have a... I have. Yeah. 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 I, I, I've always been, I've always been working as a teacher. Um, so I studied French at university, um, was my, my degree. Um, and I did my CELTA immediately after... Uh, finishing university and then I went to Italy uh, to live for a year Um, and Italy is a very wonderful country like it's it's a very nice place to be but I was um, TEFL salaries aren't particularly high uh, in in, in Italy and so um, I wasn't able to have perhaps quite the life I'd anticipated uh, living there and yeah and then I saw a job offer for um for, for Ukraine and just thought why not I know nothing about this country I know you know I wanted something different anyway like I wanted sort of uh, you know, new new people new language new culture this sort of everything and um, and yeah I only planned to stay for a year and then I just sort of fell in love with the with the country and with the culture and yeah 10 years later like I'm still still have a home there so I'm, I'm very very fortunate to to Amazing. have been you know to be part of that. On just, the first episode, yes. we talked about uh, perceptions of Ukraine and how uh, Ukraine mm. is worldwide known. What was your perception before a uh, first visit in Ukraine? Honestly, I knew very little about Ukraine at this time. Um, so I, I moved to Ukraine in 2013, um, in, in the summer, it was in August 2013. And b- before then, I, I knew... Yeah, basically nothing. I mean, I I knew that um, uh, I knew the capital was Kyiv. Uh, I knew that um, uh, I knew a little bit about the history, obviously, of the occupation of Ukraine by the Soviet Union. Um, but other than that, I didn't really know very much. And this was kind of one of the reasons why I wanted to go was because I want I wanted to experience a culture in a country that I didn't know anything about that was completely completely new to me. Um, I mean, as you said, yeah, nowadays, obviously, people do know a lot about Ukraine, for, for unfortunately, for very um, sort of very, very, very sad reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, but at that time, uh, yeah, my knowledge was extremely limited before I first came to the country. So it was um, it was a very a culture shock. Yeah. But, but yeah, it was a bit of a culture shock. I mean, when, when I first arrived in, in Odessa, um, like. The, the whole sort of like language was a really big problem for me for my first few months because I didn't speak. I mean, at, at that time, Odessa was extremely um, Russian speaking and I, I didn't know either language, really. I didn't I didn't, wasn't able to speak anything. So the first couple of months were quite a challenge uh, to adapt to the culture and to the to the country. But um, yeah, I, I, I did change. I did adapt. And yeah, I'm very, I had a very positive experience and I still do uh, being, when I'm in Ukraine. It's, it's wonderful. What impressed you the most at that time uh, when you moved? I think, well, I mean, I think Odessa particularly, it just had everything for me when, when I was like, the city is just such a wonderful place. Like the people are fantastic. Uh, you've got marvelous um, uh, beaches and, and countryside around. Um, the food is excellent, and I was I was just kind of from somebody who's who came from sort of a slightly more um, 
I don't, my, my, the area where I lived when I was a child, for example, it wasn't particularly sort of um, multicultural. It was very sort of, kind of sort of simple, simple English, simple, simple British. And then coming to this place where it was almost like sort of a melting pot of a city with lots of different people from different places and the whole a kind of variety of what was available in the desert really had a very strong effect on me. I mean, I've had the privilege of visiting many cities in Ukraine during my time, but Odessa will always be kind of like the most special place for me because I, it, it was it was my introduction to, to Ukraine and yeah, it was, it was my first home in, in, in Ukraine. So it was always, um, yeah, yeah, your first time. It will always be a very special place to me. Yeah, yeah. It is. so let's take a little break to talk about some news this week and Vita's going to talk about some heavy dark news and I'm going to talk about some happy news you can go I'll first just stick to happy news myself also <laughs> you're going to stick uh, to happy news as well okay. yeah it's uh, yeah, on the uh, 6th of December a Christmas tree was planted in uh, the center of Kiev and the lights of a uh, main Christmas tree have been turned on uh, St. Sophia Square. And the theme of today's Christmas tree is Brave Hearts. And uh, it's, uh, the Christmas tree itself uh, was funded entirely by charity donors. And uh, no state money was uh, spent on it. There's a, uh, I have a quote from uh, Mayor of Kiev, Vitaly Klitschko, and mm -hmm. the quote is, uh, Today, following tradition, on St. Nicholas Day, the main Christmas tree of the country was lit up in St. Sophia Square in Kiev. Our Christmas tree, like last year, is uh, an artificial one, uh, 12 meters high. Its installation and decoration were funded by sponsors. That's what Mayor uh, tells. And uh, each year uh, after Maidan, the Christmas tree was moved from Maidan itself to St. Sophia, uh, near St. Sophia Cathedral. Before that, uh, every year the Christmas tree was planted on um, Maidan and uh, during the uh, Revolution of Dignity, it was uh, covered with uh, all that uh, banners, with all the mottos that were very important for that revolution. Interesting. Has it put everyone in a good mood, in a Christmassy mood? Not everyone. I think that we try to have a bit of Christmas mood, mm -hmm. despite uh, the nightmare that's going on. Mm -hmm. Like we are forcing ourselves to make some things normal, to uh, feel a bit more alive than we could be. Yeah. I think we should call this segment Vita and Sandy's Good News of the Week. Yeah. There's so much darkness on the internet. <laughs> yeah, and so having having too much nightmare around, we can stick to something good and something positive. Yeah, as it's very important. My good news story of the week: an ivy bag for disasters that doesn't need gravity. So these South Korean student inventors have been awarded the 2023. James Dyson Award for an air pressure controlled IV bag that will allow rescuers in disaster situations much more flexibility when administering life-saving fluids and drugs. So basically it's an IV bag that you don't have to hold up. You know how if uh, you're moving a patient, you have to hold the IV bag up in the air so that gravity makes it work. So this is called the Golden Capsule, a non-powered hands-free IV device that uses elastic forces and air pressure differences rather than gravity. This means that medics in disaster zones do not have to hold up IV bags while transporting patients, and electricity is not required to control the infusion rate. It might be very helpful. The, the team will continue to conduct prototype improvements and user tests in collaboration with medical experts. So these are all students at a, I, I think they look like university students. So that's my good news of the week. Which is harder to learn, do you think, English or Ukrainian? Oh, well, <laughs> that's, a, that's a, a big question. So um, it's kind of hard to say because so, so much depends on where you are coming from in terms of your native language. I mean, yeah, as, as all of us are aware, I think English is an extremely complicated language. I mean, there are so many different things for students they have to 
remember and then you give students rules and then it's like oh yeah, yeah by we the don't way follow the... any of the rules <laughs> yeah exactly yeah there's so many exceptions and people don't actually do this and people break them and and I, yeah. I think the number of exceptions in English um, and particularly as well I think um, the use of articles is a real problem in my experience for Ukrainian speakers because obviously in, in the Ukrainian language that the, there are no articles they, they don't exist as a, as a concept um and so especially for that I think is extremely extremely challenging um but and at the same time if we look at the Ukrainian language there are also a, a huge number of rules within Ukrainian which are extremely complicated for uh, foreigners to, to learn and to try and try and master. I mean, I've been studying Ukraine now for four or five years. And if we look, for example, at um, what's called Vidminovanya Chislivnikiv, which is the uh, how numbers are changed depending on what grammatical role they are playing in the sentence, I still have incredible problems trying to build sentences in, in the right way because there are just so many, like, for example, for the number... For the number one, there are so many different words for the number one or different forms of the word, depending on exactly what you're trying to say. And it's very, very difficult sometimes to to get it right. So I think it's hard to say that one language is necessarily more difficult than the other. But certainly both languages do have kind of um, very uh, they, they do pose a lot of difficulties for people who are, who are studying the language, I, I would say. Yeah. So, uh, and how long how, how long have you studied Ukrainian so far? Uh so it's been out four no yeah about four or five years already. I guess maybe five years actually because um when I lived in in Odessa um I first I started learning Russian um for, for two reasons. Um first of all I was told by people there that uh, Odessa is a Russian speaking city and it was almost kind of like offensive to speak uh Ukrainian in, in, in Odessa, which very sadly I, I believed at that time. Um, but also because it was very unusual to hear Ukrainian anywhere in Odessa at that moment, like menus were in Russian or in English. And so I studied it for a couple of years in, in total. Um, but then when I moved to Kyiv, I started, people started communicating to me in Ukrainian and things were written in Ukrainian. And it was kind of almost embarrassing really that I had lived in this country for a few years by that point and I still couldn't really understand or communicate in anything um so I decided to start learning uh start learning Ukrainian from, from that point on and I've forgotten almost everything in Russian now I can still remember a few words here and there but Ukrainian has completely replaced it because it's my normal language of communication now mm -hmm. um my wife is Ukrainian. She's a Ukrainian speaker. Her family are all Ukrainian speaking. So it's kind of like the only sort of regular language that I use nowadays. And yeah, it's been and it does help living in that environment, I guess, too. So, so your method of learning Ukrainian was a total immersion into. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's, it's really helpful. Um, I mean, I know that obviously not everybody has the opportunity to do this, but throwing yourself just into the culture and into, into the language. Yeah, you're going to make mistakes, but. So what? That's you know that's how how we learn new things and um, having this sort of total immersion yeah into into the culture into uh, you know into um, into music into TV into film it does have a really really sort of um, powerful effect let's say mm -hmm. on the on the way that I was able to to, to learn the language um, but it's also a necessity as well because again like in in Lutz where I, where I live now for example you know it, it it's um that's pretty much always been since I've been there it's always been Ukrainian speaking and I, I need it to communicate so it's kind of like it's a it's a requirement almost more than more than anything else for me all right do you would you are you ready for your word yeah I'll take not very hard but not very uh, light word it's uh the foreigner you know them it's Inozemets. Inozemets? Inozemets. Inozemets. Is it right. like a z at the end? T. T. Like t, s. But in one sound. Like more like a diphthone, but it's uh, the separate sound. T. It, could you say it one more time? Inozemets. 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 Yeah. Yes. Like, and uh, it's palatalized. T. In Inozemets. Uh, there's no politicization in uh, in English, so it's uh, it could it could be hard. In those I think I'm overthinking it now. 
<laughs> Inner, inner, inner zemets. inner zemets. Like, inner zemets. Inner zemets. Yeah, Inner zemets. you can be too. Yeah, yeah. Inner zemets. Like, uh, we have this politicalization in Ukrainian, like, you have T sound and T sound. You have N and N. So uh, it's very common for Ukrainian and it's not present in English. So it, it could be hard for non-Ukrainians or non-Slavic to Mm -hmm. Or for pronounce inner this. Mm -hmm. Okay, are you ready for your word? It's going to be great. Yeah. All right, put it in the chat. Oh. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> That's really close. That's really close. Where's just a... Worst, worst, just a worst. I can't even say it. Worst, just a worst, just a sure source. Worst, just a source. Worst, Yeah, many people many people call it Wust uh Worcestershire. <laughs> Worcestershire Worcestershire sauce. Worcestershire, Worcestershire sauce. Um well, what advice would you give to Ukrainian language beginners? So for the people who are just starting to learn Ukrainian as uh, Ukrainian became very popular uh, apparently on Duolingo platform and Yes. uh, some others and what was uh, the most confusing when you started to learn it and what was uh, what advice could you give to those who want to learn it and uh, striving Yeah, so I mean, I think it goes back to I think the kind of the most important thing is not to be afraid to make mistakes, because so many people don't want to communicate in a language because they think that people will, they, they will laugh at them or make fun of them or, or whatever. And in my experience, particularly, if we focus particularly on the Ukrainian language, people just aren't like that. P people love it when you try and communicate in 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 their native language, because I think especially for the Ukrainian language, which has had such a um, a difficult history with lots of um, repression of the Ukrainian language and culture, that when a person tries to make a bit of an effort and just even just with some basic words and phrases, it makes such a difference because I, I think it's almost like a recognition of, of like, you know, that there are people who are not Ukrainian who can speak this language to a, to a certain extent. Um, And I think it's, it's, a, it's a really powerful thing to be able to communicate with somebody in, in, in their native language. Um, I would also say as well, just to add to this, that it can be very daunting starting with Ukrainian because you've got this whole new alphabet, you've got this whole new way of communicating, the sentence structure is different, the grammatical structure is different, and Completely different trying sounds to sort of... of, of letters as well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It, it it took me a couple of years before I could hear the difference all the time between the letters sh and sh, for example. That took me quite a while to get right because um, it, it, it's very, I don't know, to my ears, it was very, very hard to, to, to hear this difference. Um, but I, th I think, yeah, if, if you try and sort of do everything at the same time, it is going to be a bit of a, a bit of a disaster. But realizing that, again, it, it's OK to make mistakes and that you will you will make progress if you study, if you practice, even if you feel like you're not going anywhere, you are still developing your knowledge at the same time. And I think just kind of taking this sort of slow and steady approach um, is, is a good way to be dealing with it, because You know, Ukrainian is such a complicated language. I mean, it's very, very hard to master even parts. Of it. And even Ukrainians themselves have difficulty sometimes with, with constructing Ukrainian. So um, I think you have to be sort of, yeah, take, take your time with it, I guess. Yeah. So is the on, best on the way. flip side of that, what would you what would you say to Ukrainians who want to practice English, for example, with a mentor at Balakun, but are afraid of making mistakes or afraid of their way their accent sounds or something like that? Yeah, I mean, I, I would kind of probably give a similar advice in terms of mistakes, because, you know, you are going to make mistakes. That is just a fact. You know, you, you cannot avoid that. But my, my philosophy in the way that I, as, as I mentioned before, in the way that I tell my students is that if you make mistakes, that is a good thing, because you cannot, you cannot progress unless you make mistakes. You need to learn that something is wrong before you can learn how to do it correctly. Mm -hmm. Um And again, you know, particularly within an environment like this, where you have, you know, you have a mentor, you have somebody who is there to help you, you know, they're not going to laugh at you, they're not going to make fun of you, that the whole purpose of this is to help you develop your knowledge of the language. And um, it is a very hard sort of kind of psychological barrier to go through of, this, of, of worrying about making mistakes. I, I know, particularly a couple of Ukrainians who I know who've had very 
uh, traumatic experiences in the Ukrainian school system uh, with uh, how their teachers react to mistakes and get things and get things wrong. Um, but when you are within the kind of a, let's say, a, a safer environment, let's let's call it like this, um, you know, you, you have the opportunity to make mistakes and to be corrected and to understand why those mistakes are wrong. And that's such a, a wonderful opportunity to be able to, to, to do that. Um, and the other thing as well, I would say, is that English is obviously a very, very widely spoken language. So at least if, if you if a person communicates with a native speaker of English, uh, particularly like, for example, in, in, in Britain, um, in, in my country, we are very used to hearing a, a huge variety of accents. You know, not not, not everybody including native speakers, we don't all speak with, you know, received pronunciation and perfect uh, pronunciation yeah. of words. And so it, it's not going to be something unusual to us to, to yeah, hear people speak with, a, with an accent. I, I, yeah. I've had heard so many students say, um, how bad is my accent? And I'm like, what do you mean bad? It's it's your accent. Yeah. It's not good or bad. <laughs> it's, the, I, the, I, there is, yeah, I, I feel like sometimes that there is kind of like this opinion that um, people should have, or certainly from students who I've had, they they do have this opinion that there should be kind of like a, you know, a, a British accent, like say. Queen's then, English. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The Queen's English. But then it, it's like, but do you really want to speak like that? Because I mean, Nobody if you do, <laughs> okay, fine. But like, yeah, like sort of only about two or three percent of British people have received pronunciation. I mean, I I don't. And, I, you know, I'm, I, I have sort of standard Northern English accent and you know there's nothing there's nothing wrong having having an accent is part in in my view having an accent is part of your linguistic identity yeah. and if you i mean if you want to speak in received pronunciation then okay that is your goal and you know i'm not here to to patronize that but at the same time having sort of a, a ukrainian accent when you speak in english is part of who you are and i i don't think erasing that is necessarily something that is so essential in order to communicate well in english or indeed in any other language like getting getting rid of it so yeah. i don't think it's something people people worry about it too much basically i think is the the way i, I see it do you want to talk about i don't want us to be banned yeah so uh let's stick to uh Krovimnitsky, uh meme okay okay so you're gonna have to the describe the description the, the description is really simple okay. um if you imagine a silent hill movie mm-hmm uh, you see uh, there is a scene where uh, a girl enters Silent Hill and there's a, a banner uh, that tells welcome to Silent Hill. And the Silent Hill is substituted with Kropivnitsky. Mm -hmm. And this meme is bound to uh, the 29th of November uh, where uh, there was a very thick fog in Kropivnitsky. Mm. And I think that the inhabitants of Kropivnitsky made this meme. So Kropivnitsky is a very industrial city. Mm -hmm. And uh, many people who live there, I've never been there. I believe that it's a great city. But uh, many of people who live there uh, tell that uh, it's very industrial and very pessimistic, like uh, Silent Hill is. Mm -hmm. so that's the bound to it okay so that's so a thick fog descended on Kropivnitsky uh, yeah so um, language itself is very uh, common or very bo bound to a way of thinking to mentality mm -hmm. um, yeah. and speaking of mentality uh, what have you noticed so far and what uh, even distracts you or what pleases you in Ukrainian way of thinking so like uh, we have that this common uh, way of thinking uh, despite uh, different regions and despite different uh, history of the regions we all have almost the same way of thinking and w what you like about it or what distracts you well, I mean, what, what, one thing, one thing certainly is um, that I've one of the positives that I've experienced living in Ukraine is that Ukrainians are generous to a fault. I mean, they are some of the most wonderful, hospitable people uh, I have ever met. And sometimes it can be kind of quite disarming. Like I, I know that if I go to one of my friends' houses in Lutsk, like I will come in, yeah, they will say, <laughs> yeah, literally, like it's the exact conversation. Like, are you hungry? No. Okay, sit down. I'll make you some borscht. <laughs> like it, it happens every single time, and 
this is just something that it's it, i mean it, it's it's wonderful you know it, it, it's it's a fantastic thing to, to to be like this um at least from my perspective because i get food everywhere i go but at the same time it, it, it's kind of like it's it's when i first came it was quite unusual with how generous ukrainians are in this respect because it was just something that i i really wasn't wasn't used to um but I mean, the, the Ukrainian mentality is obviously, I mean, it is very much shaped by history as well, um, I, I think. And because like Ukrainians, at least who I know, tend to be slightly more pessimistic in their outlook about life, um, which is kind of understandable, I think, because, again, of the, the history of the country. Um, but the, the Ukrainian mentality, in t- at least in terms of how they treat uh, guests uh, and people who visit them, it's just it's just wonderful. And it, it's a real... You know, it, it's a privilege to to be able to to, to experience that. I, I think you know, when b- being in being in Ukraine, it's it's a, it's a really it's a really wonderful thing. I have to say. And speaking of it, uh, of Ukrainian cuisine itself, uh, how do you find mm-hmm. it? And what's your favorite? And what you cannot accept or get used to? Yeah. So there are many things that I love about Ukrainian food. Um, probably my favorite Ukrainian dish is uh, borscht. But only red borscht, uh, green borscht, I cannot <laughs> eat. It's just absolutely horrible. Um, but some red borscht with the, um, no, the use the grain word there, with the sour cream. And um, there's also a small type of bread called pampushki, which we have with, with borscht as well, which I like very, very much. Um, with garlic. Yeah, with, oh, with garlic. It's just the, it's just the best. Um, but also one thing that I like is that obviously in different parts of Ukraine, there are different uh, types of food. So like in Odessa, for example, that like a forshmak, for example, um, in the Carpathians, what they're banosh in from Crimea, Chaboreki, which are wonderful. Um, and you know, there is there is a very great diversity even within this one country of of food. Um one thing that I don't like, I, I have to <laughs> probably have to add here is uh holodets. Um, this is uh, sort of meat in gelatin is probably the best way I can describe it. Uh, it looks a little bit like dog food to me, which is probably why I, why I, I can't eat it. It's just I, I've never really enjoyed it, unfortunately. Um, it can be really tasty. Yeah, th- th- this this is always the answer I get. Like whenever I say I don't like it, it's like, well, you need to try my grandmother's. You know, my grandmother <laughs> makes very, very good. Uh, exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I know for, for some people, I think it's quite difficult to accept that. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't like it necessarily. <laughs> um, but yeah, but in general, I mean, the, the food is fantastic, and particularly in Odessa and in Kiev, um, there are a huge variety of restaurants as well. I mean, not just Ukrainian food, but from like from Georgian cuisine as well, for example, which I like very much. And um, you're, you know, you, you're never short of a good restaurant to go to. Basically, there's always some, uh, good, there's some uh, nice places to to visit. And so, is there um, anything you miss from the UK, food wise? Uh not very much to be honest with you. But that's because most British food is pretty terrible. Which I, I, I should <laughs> just probably say quite, quite quietly, it's it's not really, it's not really that nice. You know, I mean, maybe the occasional fish and chips I might miss once in a while, but like. At least when I lived here, when I was growing up, um, if we ever went to a restaurant, it was always like an Italian restaurant we went to, or if we got a takeout, it would be Chinese or it would be Indian and kind of like sort of British food itself is, yeah, it's not great. So I I can't really (laughs) say that. I I can't really say that I miss it that much, to be honest with you. I miss, actually, one thing I do miss is British beer. Uh, because the way it's made in the UK is it's not the same as it's brewed in Ukraine, generally speaking. Uh, so I do occasionally miss that, but that's probably about it, really. There's not not a huge amount I miss about the UK when I'm when I'm not here. So I think that's probably about it. Yeah. And um, uh, if talking not about food or cuisine, what do you miss uh, from uh, Britain, Ukraine, or what lacks you? Well, I mean, again, in in Britain, there's there's not a huge amount that keeps me here because after I finished university, I left the country. This was when I was 22. Um, I left the UK to move to Italy and all of my sort of adult life, I've lived abroad um, in Italy for one year and then the rest of my time in Ukraine. Um, I mean, of course, I have my my parents here. My brothers live here and I do do miss them occasionally, of course, having having family. Um, But in terms of kind of like British sort of, you know culture and, and things there's not a huge amount that I really miss to be honest with you when, when I'm not here but I, I think that is partly because of the fact that yeah I, I left so early in my 
adult life and yeah didn't really only really come back for summer and christmas and, and that's that's about it really um there's a lot of things that i miss though about ukraine when i'm not there but i think it's mainly just again because i've lived there for 10 years it is just kind of the, the way of life and the culture um your new home and yeah it's, it's just it, I, I do miss it i'm just used to it i think more than anything and it is you know I, I, I do miss it to a certain extent when i'm when i'm not here can I ask, what do you find the most rewarding thing about teaching? Let's try and recruit some new mentors here. Yeah, so teaching, uh, I did, so I have to start this by saying I never planned to become a teacher originally. I was originally planning to do sort of uh, interpreting or translating with French was my kind of original plan after I graduated from university. Um, but then during my degree, I lived in France for a year teaching English to uh, primary school and secondary school children. And it was just wonderful. It was just, it was just such a fantastic experience to have people, um, especially kids who are actually interested in what you had to say, who 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 wanted to know what you know about life. And I think this is very much relevant to what to, to, to with your project is the fact that you're going to have people who are extremely motivated, people who really want to learn the English language and culture of whichever country or the the, the, the mentor the mentor is from. And I think that being able to share your knowledge and being able to help somebody to learn a foreign language, presumably, you know, if they, they have some kind of goal for, I don't know, getting a better job or for emigrating or whatever the purpose it might be, um, being able to help somebody do that is, is just a wonderful, wonderful feeling. Um, and um, like for me, for example, I do, I also do like examination preparation and things like that for, for, for IELTS and, and so on. And when, when I get a message from a student to say like, yeah, you know, they've, they've got the score that they needed. They're going to move to to Canada or they're going to go to to the UK to study. It, that that makes it all worthwhile because it's just something where it's like, yeah, I've, I've done this. I have helped somebody to, to get something better. And this person is, you know, hopefully going to be able to, to learn something, to do something that they want to do. And so everybody, you know, everybody wins basically, yeah, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful thing to have. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll never list. forget I had um I had someone who was practicing for an I for a, a university entrance level test um mm -hmm. and uh he, he sent me a, a message saying that he even though he was most worried about it he scored highest in the speaking part after we'd had a few sessions of talking about whatever it was that I managed to get him talking about. I think it was the TV show Breaking Bad, found something mm -hmm. that he wanted to talk about. And then he right. went and he just started and wouldn't stop. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing when that happens as well, when you find the thing that someone really wants to talk about. And, and they, yeah. yeah. And yeah, and you, you will find this as well. I, th I think, you know, some people can be a little bit... Um, some people I think can be a bit nervous communicating with people sometimes from other countries or if, if they're from a community where you know it, it is just people from their country and like okay what, what do I talk to this you know to this person about but there, there will be something and particularly I think for uh, for Ukrainians who by and large are generally interested in you know for example if we talk like about Breaking Bad as an example like American TV shows and films are extremely popular you know sports like football are very popular um and so you will find something to communicate on. And for some people, as you said, once you find this topic, suddenly everything just opens and the, the, they they just flow and can just talk and talk and talk and talk. And it's, yeah, it, it's, it's a wonderful thing when you make that connection with somebody, when you find out, yeah, this is, you know, this is, this is where we are and this, yeah. this is what we can discuss. It's great. Yeah. So, yeah. Sorry, Vit, your turn. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a few turns. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I wanted to talk about this, um, a very um, interesting topic. Uh, sure. You are very popular on Ukrainian Twitter. Yes. And uh, that's uh, the point when I uh, learned about you in the first place. Right. And uh, you uh, write mostly in Ukrainian and many people confuse you with, with Ukrainian and yes. uh, making you some awkward uh, questions about it. <laughs> uh, uh, could it tell more about this experience uh being on ukrainian twitter and being uh in the middle of uh, all the agenda that is on the ukrainian twitter yeah i mean ukrainian twitter is a magnificent beast because there are some wonderful people in ukrainian twitter but also some very odd people at the same time <laughs> at the same time as well uh which i guess is to be expected with a large sort of social media thing 
Um, but yeah, I mean, originally I started it just just to kind of sort of share my experiences um, about sort of being a, being a foreigner in Ukraine and just kind of like my experiences being there. And at the moment, unfortunately, there aren't many foreigners who speak Ukrainian. I mean, I'm, I'm still learning, obviously, I'm by no means a fluent speaker of Ukrainian, but, um, you know, I, I can communicate my ideas in the language. And it was a very odd thing where it's suddenly like, yeah, people are just like accusing me of lying about my heritage, about like I'm actually Ukrainian. I've been accused of being a Russian secret agent. I've had lots of wonderful, wild and wonderful accusations going on about because because for some people that's how it's you just know absolute... you've made it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is when you get when you get the accusations from the tinfoil hat wearers. That's when yeah. you know you've got to the to the right place. <laughs> um, but it, it's a very odd feeling sometimes, though, for people. Like some people just really find it very difficult to understand that. Yeah, I am British, and yes, I have learned Ukrainian as a well third language after after French. Um, and it's I mean, again, the, the whole in general that the, the the Ukrainian Twitter community in general is. Uh, very supportive like it's kind of like you know they, they want to share their language and I think that for some of them um, you know again being able to communicate with a foreigner in their native language is an unusual experience I would say um, but yeah it's it kind of all it, it kind of all sort of snowballed very unexpectedly for the number of people who like who I, who are now following me I don't know the exact number already but yeah it's kind of like I never expected that it would become this sort of I know this sort of experience, let's say that that that, that it is now, but it's it's a, it's a wonderful thing because I'm very happy to share my experiences and also um, I share uh, things about the English language and British culture in particular, which uh, tr I try and share things that may be sort of less well known or that people are not so aware about. Um, and yeah, because it, it also helps to develop to sort of share my culture a bit as well, because with um, with most Ukrainians who I meet. A lot of them are more aware of, for example, American English and for different sort of American culture and words and so on. Um, and so it does allow me as well to kind of like say, so yeah, so in America, they say, for example, restroom. But in British English, we use uh, loo or we use toilet or something like that, which was something that happened on Twitter yesterday. Um, so it does allow sort of to give a, a more open perspective of that. Yeah, you know, there's not only one correct way to speak English. And yeah, it just gives the opportunity for people to discover more things about this as well I think which is and more context about why we do some of the strange things we do in English <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah I mean I, I try I try and open up sort of I try and sort of yeah open up a few not secrets exactly but like sort of why yeah why we do certain things why we you know what's the point of articles for example or you know why flammable and inflammable mean the same thing or something like that <laughs> but it's 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 you know there's always going to be within like the confines of a tweet is always going to be very difficult to fully explain any concept because there's so many different you know rules and exceptions and everything else so I just try and you know do it as generally as I can and if I can help somebody develop their knowledge then that that can only be a good thing you know that's, yeah. it makes me happy I can do that but yeah okay what's your interesting fact for this week mm, my fact is about the longest trumpet of the world is trambita mm -hmm. it's uh, an alpine horn made of wood mm -hmm. and it is common among, among uh, ukrainian highlanders uh, hutsuls mm -hmm. uh, who live in western ukraine and it's less popular but it's also present in eastern Pol uh, poland slovakia and northern romania this um, instrument uh, the sound of this uh, instrument was present in Slana's wild dances, uh, winning uh, Eurovision in 2004. Interesting. This instrument is actually used not uh, just for music, it is used as a mean of communication to let uh, uh, everyone know for, about such uh, events like uh, the beginning or ending of the working day, a birth of a child, marriage, or some danger, the upcoming danger. So uh, its purpose was more of, is used more uh, by shepherds to communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. Over long distances. Over long distances. And in mountains, some time ago, it was the only mean to commun for communication. Mm -hmm. And the length of it is from two and a half to eight meters. Eight so meters. So it's that eight meters. It's wow. that long. It's made of the wood of a spruce or pine, spruce mo mostly. 
And spruce itself is very, very common in Kabathian mountains. And in Ukrainian, it's called Smareka. There's also a, a, a song about Smareka. And in other districts of Ukraine, you can hardly find it. So it's uh, more Carpathian-based uh, plants. I think there are some of those in that movie that I watched, Shadow of Forgotten Ancestors. Yeah, yeah. it's used there. Yeah. So my interesting fact of the week is that New Zealand was the first country to give women the vote in the year 1893. And in 2022, oh. women had the majority of seats in the New Zealand parliament for the first time. So there were more women in parliament than men for the first time in 2022. I've got another question here about how would you advise mentors to encourage students who are very shy about speaking English? Do you have any tips or yeah, anything I mean, to create a good environment? Yeah, I mean, I think if, if a student is shy, in my experience, again, it comes back to two things. It's either because they extremely... Obviously, they, they maybe don't have much experience previously in communicating in a foreign language, which obviously is a very typical thing. Um, or again, going back to school, they've had such a traumatic experience of making mistakes that it's just kind of like they they just really do not want to, uh, to repeat that experience. And so... I think that trying to set out the idea from 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 a from from a teacher's perspective to literally maybe even explain to the student that you know we are you know we're we're, we're here to help we're not here to judge um the whole point of this process is for us to be able to communicate and to help each other you know I'm not going to I'm not going to laugh at you I'm not going to to make fun of you um you know we 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 are here to help and i think sometimes just even just setting that out directly to the student can can make a really really big, big difference because people need to know that they feel uh comfortable in a particular environment because as soon as you have what's known as this effective filter as soon as you have this it's it's very hard for the student because if if they feel nervous or shy or anything they're obviously completely valid feelings but then it's going to really impact on the way that they are able to communicate and to uh, absorb new information new ideas so i think trying to create this sort of environment where you can explain to them, you know it's okay you know you're allowed to make mistakes you know we're not going to laugh at you we're not going to make fun of you as soon as they feel more comfortable like this it will take time it's not just going to be like a switch and suddenly they start communicating but when they get this idea that yeah it's okay to be here it's okay to feel comfortable they will slowly start to almost like uh uh to 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 trust you more let's say and then uh, over time it will it will become better but sometimes it can be a slow process sometimes it can take you know weeks or months to to encourage somebody to come out of their shell and to start communicating and to realize that actually yeah you know you do want to listen to them you do want to hear what they have to say and for some people that can be an unusual experience that you know, to, to have someone actually wanting to listen to them um i deliberately put in in our first sort of introduction lesson uh, a section mm. where the student has to teach the teacher how to say some greetings in ukrainian yeah. um just to show them that it's it's we're just as terrible <laughs> you know <laughs> at pronouncing ukrainian words and you're trying to teach your mouth to do a whole different language a whole different set of sounds um so that's one way that we try to kind of break the ice at the very start of the of the sessions yeah I, I think that's a wonderful idea because again there is often this this conception or this preconception probably is a better word that there is almost like a hierarchy it's like the teacher is above the student and again I think this does come back from educational processes and everything else um but yeah doing an activity like that is a wonderful idea because then it kind of like, it like brings the teacher down to your level it's kind of like you know we are we are the same you know I, I'm not I'm not superior. I'm not better. This is like an informational um, exchange, I, I guess we can describe it as. Um, and so, yeah, it's kind of like, yeah, we, you know, we, we don't speak Ukrainian very well. You know, we don't speak uh, another language very well. And that's OK. You know, we can we can help each other almost as, as we go through this. And, and also because um, a lot of us aren't teachers, actually, <laughs> you know, we're just, yeah, well, <laughs> we were fluent in English. So, yeah, so. but but again, that that's ju just because a person doesn't have you know a, a an in, a TEFL qualification or anything like this, it doesn't mean that you can't share ideas. It doesn't mean that you can't you know give give some insight into how we understand the language because even 
even just being in that environment is hugely beneficial. And um, if it's just purely, you know, for, for listening skills or for speaking skills, it, it, it is a good thing to have. And, you know, to have this opportunity available, it's, it's, it's marvelous, really. It's, it's yeah. a wonderful, wonderful idea. Yeah. Beat, how did, how did you learn at school versus after school? Oh, actually, I had very um, proficient teachers at school. So mm -hmm. uh, that's good. The most of my English is from, uh, the most grammar is from school. Uh, I have forgotten much <laughs> in some years as I didn't practice English. Uh, yeah. And, um, then self-education came and mm -hmm. that wasn't the, 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 the two third or like one third of uh, English, English learning, like two thirds was at school actually. Yeah. What overwhelmingly we find when we are um, talking to our students is that they 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 did all of the grammar and the vocabulary at school, but they just didn't have time, didn't have any money to practice with. So that's why we think that this is a, um, such a cool opportunity for both the mentors to do something really rewarding and the students to just practice talking with someone it's not a lesson it's not you know you don't have a whiteboard and a... <laughs> yeah you don't, you don't have grades <laughs> no grades. exactly yeah, yeah no pressure yeah yeah you're not going to get your yeah 12 points isn't it in the ukrainian system as i recall but um yeah but that but that's very true because i mean that that kind of tallies with my own experience as well but yeah that i mean ukrainians now well, almost all of them, they have to study English at school. It is a compulsory subject. So most of them do have a fundamental knowledge of the language anyway. Um, but yeah, a lot of the lessons, uh, at least from my students' experience, are they're not about communication, which in my view is the most important part of language. They were very theoretical, yeah, very grammatically based. And so they don't often have the opportunity, as, you, as you've highlighted, to just just to use the language just to be able to speak and to communicate and and yeah having being able to unlock those kind of ideas by being able to communicate with a native speaker it's uh yeah like i said it's, it's really going to be beneficial and also as well for the mentors to be able to find out a little bit more about um you know to find out about ukraine and ukrainian culture which may be you know maybe maybe they don't know that much about about ukraine and 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 the nation uh it, it can be wonderful in both directions yeah to, to find out more about each other as well you know, to yeah, make sort of a, yeah. A personal connection. let's try and end on something positive do you have a, a sure. good um <laughs> a good uh english language joke for us an english language oh my god uh okay I... you can just have one someone like um two men walk into a bar you would have thought one of them would have noticed <laughs> Thank you so much. It was a real pleasure to meet you. I can't wait to put this podcast together. Veet, was there anything you wanted to say before we sign off? Uh, no, that's it. I just wanted to just thank Daniel for a great con conversation. It was uh, very interesting and optimistic, I can say. <laughs> thank you for having me. It's been a been a pleasure. To, it's been a pleasure to be here. And yeah, I wish your mentors and students and and the project uh, every success as you as you go forward. And actually, I have no doubt it will be. <laughs>